My name is Robert Keen. I'm the immediate past president of the Board of Trustees at the Jewish Museum of Maryland. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual presentation tonight, Memories of Jewish Chile. This program continues our series about global Jewish life. Please consider joining us next Thursday, August 26th at 1 p.m. We welcome Jean Nagger for her presentation, Sipping from the Nile. She will recount her memories of growing up in this vibrant community and discuss the profound impact the Suez crisis had on her family and the wider Jewish community in Egypt. At the close of the program, we will share a link to register for this event. As a reminder, you can also view recordings of the past programs in this series on our website using the link in chat. Throughout this series, we have been fortunate to highlight Jewish communities around the world, from India to Cuba and Iraq. This evening presents the second opportunity this month to learn a little more about Jewish life in South America. If you didn't have an opportunity to hear Dr. Brodsky present on Argentina, I strongly encourage you to listen to the presentation in the coming weeks. So now, please allow me to introduce our speaker tonight. Marjorie Agosin was born in Bethesda, moved to Chile, and attended the Hebrew school in Santiago, Chile. After the coup in 1973, she and her family left for the US. She received a BA from the University of Georgia, go Bulldogs, and an MA and PhD in Latin America literature from Indiana University. At the age of 37, she became one of the youngest women ever to obtain a full professorship at Wellesley College where she is now the Andrew W. Mellon, Professor in the Humanities and Professor of Spanish. She's a Chilean American poet and writer. She's gained notability for her fight for women's rights in Chile and has been honored for her work by being awarded the United Nations Leadership Award in Human Rights. She has received many literary awards, including the Gabriela Mistral Medal of Honor by the Government of Chile for Life Achievement and the Pura Belpre Award for her novel, I Lived in Butterfly Hill. She's gained international attention and featured in the New York Times, Forbes Magazine, and the Washington Independent. She divides her time between Wellesley, Mass, the coast of Maine, and the coast of Chile. And before we welcome Marjorie, I'd just like to give a warm shout out to Edith Silverman, who's watching from Santiago, Chile, who we met three years ago in British Columbia. So please give a warm Jewish Museum of Maryland welcome to Marjorie. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a great honor for me uh, to, to be a part of this series. And I really um, uh, commend the work of the Jewish Museum of Baltimore, the state of Maryland. Uh, the place I was born for, for these wonderful events you, you are putting to the larger public. I, as you know, as you've heard, I am a, a professor of literature and a writer, but uh, history is one of my passions. And I'm not a historian, but I do believe that uh, in order to, to write, you must know the, the courses and the paths of history. So to begin, sharing with you the history of the Jews of Chile. I would like to begin in 1492. We are much more familiar with the 20th century, but uh, in 1492, the Reyes Catolicos, the Catholic Kings, Isabel and Ferdinand um, wrote the Edict of Expulsion, El Edicto de Expulsion, where uh, Jews had to, to live um, Spain, where they have lived for thousands of years in convivencia. And uh, it is said, history says it and doesn't say it, that uh, Columbus was of Jewish origins and he wanted to find the new world so that Jews could be brought into safety. So with the Edict of Expulsion, some Jews chose to convert and others uh, went to the Ottoman Empire and others, very few, went to Latin America. And in the ships of Columbus, there were many, many Jews like Juan de Torres 
And one uh, Jew that arrived with the conquistadores, with, with the expedition, was a conquistador himself, Diego de Almagro. Everyone in Chile knows because we study Pedro de Valdivia and Diego de Almagro. And uh, at the same time, um, the Inquisition reached the shores of the New World and a, a, a very uh, prominent uh, doctor that arrived to the coast of Chile, Francisco de Maldonado, um, was sent to, to Lima, Peru, and then was burned at the stake. So the history of the Jews and the history of, of many persecuted people has been a, a history of expulsion, affirmation, and at the same time, relieving the same history they left because the autos de fe, which were the, the burnings, also happened in South America. After, after this time, there was very little Jewish immigration. And I, I think, and historians agree, that from 1830s to 1850, there was a very, very important immigration to Chile from the Ottoman, from the displaced Ottoman Empire. And it's very interesting because Jews came to Chile from Monastir, Macedonia, and some parts of the Balkans. At the same time, a lot of German Jews and French Jews arrived to Valparaíso. I think in the audience there's a friend of mine, Enrique and Silvia Testa, and um, I believe Enrique's father was the first born into a, a very special Sephardic community in the south of Chile called the Intemuco. Around 1950, this community grew quite, quite large and uh, they created one of the first Sephardic synagogues in the country. And uh, I know that Enrique has shared this with me. I'd like to say that the uh, Nobel Prize winner of, of Chile, the only woman that has ever won in Latin America, Gabriela Mistral, was the teacher of, of your aunts. I think that's the story. But I think Gabriela Mistral is a very instrumental person in this whole conversation, and I will speak to you later. Then uh, this, this era of, of almost massive immigration and immigration where it was possible to arrive, immigration that was free, and people were discovering the new world, finding a better life, finding freedom, and, and finding income kind of halted. And the other great wave of immigration uh, happened at the end of World War I. And uh, also what we are most familiar with, but at the same time unfamiliar, is what happened before the years of the Holocaust and after. Um, I like to say that a great part of my own family, uh, from the side of my, my father, the Agosin family, arrived to Chile around 1907 uh, to 1912. And from the side of my mother, they arrived late because they were um, Central European Jews from Austria. And the only ones that were saved were the ones that arrived in 1938. Um, Jewish immigration is extremely complex everywhere in the world. Um, the United States uh, has this narrative that is often very false. It was very difficult to emigrate to the US if you were Jewish and to get a visa. And a lot of people that were desperately fleeing, and you can see the images that we see now of the Afghanis, desperately trying to cling to the wings of an airplane. You see that um, during the arrival of Nazism, especially after Kristallnacht, people just wanted to go to wherever they could find a visa. There was a great uh, desperation. And this is a very true story. Uh, when people say, why did you arrive to Chile or to Bolivia or to Mexico? People thought that they wanted to arrive to America. The whole idea was like, this is America. And you arrive to wherever 
somebody took you or offered you refuge. I have a, a friend in the audience that she said that her grandparents had to uh, give some money under the table to a guy that was uh, sweeping the floor of the Czech embassy in order for them to obtain visas to Chile. Uh, Chile, it says that they always, uh, another myth, that they are very welcome to foreigners, uh, but I think not so much. Not only um, they were not welcome of, of, of Jewish immigrants, but they were always suspicious, like everywhere, that these new immigrants would take the jobs, their jobs. Around 1933, that uh, the Vienna Conference, at the time that people uh, were trying to to find refuge. We had a president that was a very liberal president, Arturo Alessandri Palma, but again, he was not so liberal. And uh, he halted immigration from Europe to only allowing 50 families a year, which is, uh, if you think of 6 million people perishing, 50 families is absolutely nothing. After Alessandri finished his term, a new president came with very liberal ideas, very progressive. It was his name was Pedro Aguirre Cerda, and he opened up uh, immigrate, Jewish immigration to Chile. And as I mentioned to you before, Gabriela Vistel from Temuco, um, people people are, are are mostly familiar with her poetry, but she was a great advocate for human rights and a great advocate for the Jewish people. And he wrote in uh, European newspapers, the, the question of the Jews, what are we going to do with the persecuted Jews of Europe? And I am sure that Gabriela was instrumental in letting uh, so many people that were desperately trying to, to fight for their lives arrive to Chile. And people don't know much about this, and they don't know that we believe Gabriela Mistral was of Sephardic origin. Uh, I'd like to go back a little bit to something I missed telling you that uh, when there was a great wave of immigration from 1820s to 1850, the Panama Canal was not built yet. So they had to go through the very treacherous Cape Horn and their, their boats didn't have the, uh, the modern equipment that boats, ships have now. And the crossing was extremely, extremely dangerous. And a lot of people perished, but we do not know how many, but it was a very frightening journey. Uh, and what was interesting was that after, uh, after maybe 1850s, they created what was called the Transandino, which is called the Transandian, which is a train that connected uh, Argentina with Chile through the mountains, but this train only arrived to the city of Mendoza and then they cross uh, the rest of the journey with in a mule. And often when I was a child, I was, I always thought, are my relatives uh, creating fables as they speak or this is really the truth? Because my grandmother always told us in all occasions, that she arrived to uh, Barbaraiso in a mule. And this was absolutely true. Uh, to go back to uh, the Jewish immigration after the Holocaust, that was made possible between 38 and 45, a lot of people uh, settled in different parts of the country, Santiago, Viña, Valparaíso, where my family settled, and some of them settled in the south of Chile. Uh, and this, I'll tell you more about it, but it was my grandparents, um, my maternal grandparents settled in a town called Osorno, Chile, in the south of the country, where German settlers that had arrived again in the 1800s and stayed and had their families were there, but they were very much uh, supporters of 
Nazi ideology. And my mother grew up in such a community. And it was, um, of course, it was very dif difficult, but at the same time, um, uh, was an incredible lesson in life about who welcomes you, who doesn't look at you as a different person. And I don't know, uh, anti Semitism has many colors, but uh, I think that anti Semitism in Chile really was from an ideological perspective, from the upper class, from politicians that did not want to accept Jews, but also profited uh, by uh, selling visas to, to families. Uh, to just kind of move forward to closer to uh, the, the beginning, the late 20th century, uh, Chile uh, created many different communities. One community, the community of uh, Valparaíso was created uh, like an official community around 1915. They created uh, the first synagogue and the, the, the burial society. And um, a lot of the people that emigrated particularly were not religious, uh, but they found themselves with one member of the community that had passed and they created a minyan, uh, and, and this is how the community started because they had to begin somewhere. And uh, I have to tell you that my great grandfather who, who came from uh, Sevastopol, not particularly religious, he, because he spoke Russian, he became uh, the consul of, uh, a Russian consul in Chile because he spoke the language. But I would like to say that perhaps each community, each Jewish community in different parts of the country dealt in a different way. I think the great force of antisemitism in Chile, unfortunately, has been the Catholic Church. But in Valparaíso and Viña del Mar, they had Lutherans, they had the Anglican Church, uh, they had a cemetery of the dissidents where uh, people that atheists or with no particular religion were buried. So I think it was easier for the people that settled in Valparaíso and Viña del Mar to, to adjust to Chilean life. At the, at the present time, uh, uh, Chile has around 17,000 members of the Jewish community. Uh, I like to say that it's a community that against all odds has flourished. They have many, they have a, a Merkaz, like a central synagogue before they had the German synagogue uh, that had in, I have a, the, the information from Simone Keller that around the 1970s, they had about 4,000 members. And after Allende they came into power, only 400 because uh, people left during Allende because they fear persecution and communism. And also some people left during Pinochet. And this is a very, uh, sore point and sometimes very difficult to reconcile some Jews that supported Allende and some Jews that supported Pinochet. But for being such a small community, I don't believe that divisions are, are so good. Um, I would like to say that um, in spite of antisemitism that is everywhere and the United States is not foreign to it, I think a lot of people, and I have spoken to um, uh, and listened to the testimony of survivors, they have felt welcome in Chile. They have settled, they have created new lives, and they have prospered emotionally, economically, and spiritually. I've been very interested with, uh, I've worked with uh, Nancy Nichols, a Chilean historian that teaches at the Catholic University about the arrival of Jews in Chile during the Shoah. And it's very interesting that there are not many narratives where people speak about what happens, what happened in the journey, what happened in the ship, um, did they make friends, uh, 
what were their fears, their greatest joys, because the arrival to Chile or to any other country was extremely traumatic, was porous. You went there because you had a relative or you got a visa or simply by chance. And there is much more material about the people that settle in the country than actually diaries and accounts of the journey itself. And I find that psychologically very important and very interesting. I'm going to um, ask Laura to show some images for you. And I, I think, because I don't see the galleries, but uh, my friend and collaborator, Samuel Schatz, who lives in Santiago, uh, took these pictures that you will see. And as we go through the pictures, I will explain a little bit about what I have done as a writer with Jewish Chile. So this image is a beautiful port of uh, Valparaiso, very much run down, especially now with a lot of social unrest. Uh, but this port, it's very important to me because all my family, with the exception of my grandmother who crossed the mountains in the mule, arrived to this port. And uh, no matter what, I feel Chile is my home because they took my family, they accepted them, they gave them refuge. And I have lived much more than half of my life, more than half of my life here, but I still feel I am not completely at home here. I am a US born citizen, but absolutely a foreigner. And it's hard in a way for other people to, to understand my feelings about this. But this was, this is my home and my sea and, and the Pacific Ocean. And this is the port where my grandfather arrived around 1925 from Vienna. And this is the port where my great grandmother Helena arrived in 1939, we believe that she left from the port of Hamburg in the last ship that, that left the port, a Chilean ship called El Copiapo. This is all what I am almost 90% sure that that was her ship. She arrived with her son uh, and then they, um, they settled in Chile and they lived their entire lives there. So this is the very, very important city that I consider a port of entry. We'll go next. Valparaiso again, I won't spend too much time talking about the city, but uh, we'll just move forward, yeah. Valparaiso. Uh, I, this is a beautiful photograph that Samuel uh, took and this is, uh, the, uh, it was called then Hotel Miramar and it's um, a, a, almost, it's, it looks like a 19th century kind of European hotel that is looking at uh, the Bay of Valparaiso and this is important, this image for me because I used to go almost every Friday with my grandmother to this hotel and we talked and I had a drink and of course, reminiscent about their, their lives before they arrived to Chile. Next. Next. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, their, like I said, the Jewish community built it Hebrew schools, built it synagogues and built it cemeteries. The first was in a mausoleum in Valparaiso, but this is the Jewish cemetery of Viña del Mar. It's in um, 20 minutes from Viña del Mar, and it's called uh, El Bellotto. And almost all Chilean Jews that arrived to, to Valparaiso, they moved to Viña del Mar, are uh, buried here. And um, there is a very beautiful community called um, Jewish community of Viña del Mar uh, that takes care of the cemetery and has a Hebrew school and a synagogue. They are a handful of, of, of people that belong to this community. A lot of them are mixed marriages. A lot of them are converted to Judaism, but 
um, it's a very special community because it's very open and very welcoming. Not that the others are not, but I also feel this is uh, my community and I feel that this is really where I belong. Next. So about my writings, uh, let me just begin. And it's not propaganda about my writings, but it has to do with what we're talking about. Samuel and I work in a book that I think is a very meaningful book that combines poetry and images. It's called Memorias Trenzadas, Braided Memories. And it's about the encounter between a great granddaughter, myself, and my great grandmother, Helena Broder. But it's an encounter where I go to recapture and regain the city that she loved so much, Vienna. And through the voice of poetry, she tells me what was it like to live there during the horrific years of Nazism. But my great grandmother arrived to Chile in 1939. This is her passport. And it's all the story, it's written really in, in verse because poetry is able to speak with another voice, even more powerful than history. So next, next Laura, uh, you can see the Nazi uh, sign, sello, her passport, and that says it all um, and uh, all over, I, I believe that the Holocaust is a, a, not only a Jewish problem, it's a problem of the world. It's a, it's a problem where humanity no longer existed, where language was fractured. And I have shown this image in, in Austria and in Germany, and young people are very moved by this because they do understand. We'll go to the other. Uh, this is a beautiful image uh, that Samuel took. I don't know exactly why, but it's in the coast of Chile, which has 4,000 kilometers of coast. And this is so emblematic of travelers, refugees, immigrants, um, the suitcase, which could contain all of your memories or could contain nothing. Sometimes people say that they bring an empty suitcase so they could fill it uh, with the new memories they will acquire in, in the new country. But the suitcase is um, it's, uh, it's almost part of the body, of the hand, of the arm of a displaced person. And you stop and think, what will I take? And you usually take with you um, meaningful things, photographs, maybe some religious object. Um, and also let's face it, Jews could not take any material possessions. So I think that this image for, for me and for Samuel is very, very important because it speaks about the union of, of displacement, loss, poetry and photography. Next. The south of Chile, where my mother grew up, Volcano Sorno, a uh, very, very beautiful part of the world, still a little bit unspoiled, uh, but um, a place where uh, the German colonizer had tremendous power. And um, when I began thinking about uh, uh, Jewish Chile, I think that I'm very grateful to my mother because she told me, why don't you 30, 30 years ago, she told me, why don't you think about writing about my story? And I told her, well, who is going to be interested in our family story? But I wrote my first book that really engaged with, um, with Jewish themes, a Jewish question. It's called uh, A Cross and a Star, where I speak about her life growing up in this community with only five or six Jewish families and the rest, Nazi sympathizers, um, people that in their stores uh, sold Nazi memorabilia. Uh, but I think that my, the, the beauty of the story is that 
my mother was uh, not accepted in the Catholic school because she didn't have a baptismal certificate. And she wasn't accepted in the German school because she was a Jew. And she was accepted in the poorest of the school where indigenous girls went. And she found much love and understanding among the poorest of this community without judgment, really only love and, and community. And this is what I always believe that uh, education will not make you juster or empathic. Education has to also be, have a, a new orientation of, of the human heart. This is, um, I, don't, I don't know if this is where my mother lived or not, but she lived in a street called Freire, 52, but I think Samuel tried to find it, everything has changed. But this is a typical Chilean wooden house. Um, and I just, uh, the, uh, the book I wrote about my mother is um, uh, very poetic, it's poetic prose and it's evocative because the Chilean South has tremendous um, uh, power for your imagination, the way the rain fills in the wooden houses, the Andes, the rivers, um, the ocean. And this is a typical poor house in Osorno. Next, Laura, next. Osorno, the streets, I don't know what that is, but you can see a, a feeling for the town. Yes. I wanted to tell you that this book speaks about not so much the travels of Helena brought to Chile, but the travels of, of, uh, of a woman who wants to understand what was her life like, almost uh, to recover the post-Holocaust mem post memories. Uh, and Across the Star, again, speaks about this issue. And then I documented my, my father's life. It's called uh, Always From Somewhere Else. Uh, and I think it's a very good title for, for foreigners, for Jews. You're always from somewhere else. And uh, my father was a doctor. And it was very, very hard to be a Jew in the medical school during World War II. And, uh, it is true, my father said that he always had a knife because he, he had to defend himself. And uh, then he became uh, like uh, the first full professor of the Department of Chemistry. And we received many, many phone calls from the Opus Dei or from regular people that no Jew should have such a post. Um, and this book documents the life of my father as a medical student and also the life of their parents who, ar who arrived in the wave of immigration of the, the great programs in the 1900s, also from Sevastopol, and they were tailors, and uh, especially of course, my grandfather, and they created uh, a, 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 a tailor shop in, in Quillota. I also recorded, uh, wrote the story, a, a story for children about my grandfather and I called it the, the blooming tree, El Arbol Florido, because my grandfather was very quiet and very shy and he stuttered because he, he stuttered during the war out of fear. Um, and a way for him to show us how much he loved us without words, he put uh, chocolates under the tree. So you always saw that chocolate is grew on trees. But I will tell you a very special story that um, I think is very much like a Jewish story. Uh, my grandfather was declared illust illustrious citizen of his little village of Quillota, and they asked him to decorate the city for Christmas. And he said, sure, I'll do it. But he didn't know how to do a five-pointed star. He only knew how to do six points the Star of David. So that's all what he did. He decorated, he put it in the plaza, in the trees. And the next morning, 
somehow he said, well, we'll see what happens. Uh, uh, Kyoto became a Jewish town with a Jewish star and people didn't pay attention. And they, um, they thought that it was very beautiful to have six, a star with six points for Christmas. So it's either kindness or ignorance, but somehow it worked. And I would like to just end this before we have a, a question that um, the, there was a lot of integration between Arabs and Jews because a lot of Arabs, and they came from maybe from Egypt or from uh, Palestine, but they were of Arabic descent. They were, uh, had very good relationship with the Jewish community. Unfortunately, this is not the case because the problems in the Middle East, the problem between Israel and, um, and the, uh, the territories has been, is, has been almost transported to the Chilean reality. Before I end, I, again, I want to thank um, uh, Simon Keller and Vivian Schnitzer for this connection. I wanted to understand how many Jews arrived to Chile during the Holocaust. And they always say many, and the numbers are not very exact, but they were between 13,000 to 15,000. And that is a huge number. And it's uh, much bigger than a country that is bigger than Chile, which is Mexico. Uh, Mexico had another narrative that they accepted a lot of um, Jewish immigrants, but they accepted more people that came from Spain uh, after uh, Franco's uh, arrival of power. They accepted the Republicans, uh, Republicanos, not American Republicans. So I'd like to say that Chile did ex accept a lot of people. And um, some people that arrived to Bolivia used Bolivia as like one uh, stepping point, and then they went elsewhere. But in the case of Chile, they really remain in Chile. And again, the biggest communities are Santiago, Temuco, and Viña del Mar. I think I have spoken, uh, uh, yeah, exactly one minute before, 7.39. I will be more than happy to take uh, questions and, uh, you know, whatever I, I am able to answer, I'll be happy to do so. Thank you so much, Marjorie, for just a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm Laura Grant. I'm the program coordinator here at the Jewish Museum of Maryland, and I'm going to transition us into the Q&A for this evening's program. So for those of you that are joining us on Zoom, please submit your questions using the Q&A button that you should see at the bottom of your screen. For those of you on Facebook, you can submit your questions in the comment field and a member of our tech team will pass them along. And we'll focus um, most on the questions that are most closely related to the topics that are presented today, recognizing the limited time that we have. So I'll go ahead and get started with the first question, which is, can you discuss what your life and what your family's like, life was like a little more under Pinochet? Okay, I'd like to say that my parents left Chile, not during the coup, not in 1973, but they left it in 1968. And this is a very interesting story. My, my father was a supporter of Salvador Allende and they were friends because they were both physicians, but his lab was assaulted really and taken over by, by communist uh, students, socialists. And, um, and be because my father had grants from the National Institute of Health and the Rockefeller Foundation, and they accused him of being a, a supporter of Yankee imperialism. So they left before, and my sister and I, I left in 1972, and also my sister, and then the coup came. So I did not experience uh, life under Pinochet per se myself. 
and neither did my parents. We experienced more life before Allende. And we uh, decided that we did not want to return to Chile and live under uh, a dictatorship. But I always returned and did uh, what I think was the most important work of my life. I, I worked with um, the mothers of the disappeared. I was very engaged with the political life of the country. But I get, we were lucky not to have experienced Pinochet directly. Some of my family members stayed in Chile and some uh, left, let's say, to nearby Brazil. And I saw a comment that why, why was I born here? <laughs> I had no choice. Uh, my parents were here. My father was a, a, a student, a research fellow at the National Institute of Health. So my sister and I was born and I was born too. So, uh, you know, um, we have uh, dual citizenship and it was really an act of faith and an act of chance. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions looking for um, a bit more information and some um, reminders about Jewish life in Chile today. So can you remind us of the number of um, uh, the Jewish population in Chile and also yes. speak about um, a bit more about life there today, specifically if um, in response to um, if there's anti-Semitism? Yeah. The so the about. Jewish population is 17,000. The biggest Jewish community is the, the Merkaz. Uh, they have done a wonderful job creating a, a Jewish museum. And um, I command the Pollack family for building this museum because they have uh, exhibits for young people so they can go and understand the Holocaust. Um, of course, Chile has a lot of uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, but I'm going to be very honest because I don't know how to talk differently. I have experienced more anti-Semitism in the U.S. than at home. Uh, as a professor, um, uh, always having to justify or explain who I am. And the anti-Semitism in Chile, in a way, is almost a little bit due to ignorance because they, they ask things like, what do the Jews eat and why are you, why do you fast on certain days? Why are you so different? Because they don't know. And I think that, I like to say that the great mission that we have for the Jewish communities of Chile is to be open, to have people come for Rosh Hashanah, to, to invite people that are not Jewish to, to a sukkah, to, to make us, to make them and us as part of a community that is united by different faiths. Uh, but the anti-Semitism in Chile is, I would say, is due to ignorance and due to the uh, upper classes. And also right now, unfortunately, the left, the communist left and the socialist left is extremely anti-Semitic in the country. But also the left here, the universities are anti-Semitic. Uh, they have unions that boycott Israel much more than in Chile. I think this big monster of anti-Semitism is here. Uh, and uh, some people do not look at the signs, choose not to look at signs. So we heard from your bio at the beginning about um, some of the human rights work that you've done. Can you tell us a bit more about human rights in Chile and the work that you're doing? Well, I, I did a lot of uh, work when I felt that it was very important to do. So my work in human rights is fold in two, two ways. Um, when I was very young, a graduate student, I became very involved with what is called arpilleras, which are the tapestries woven by the mothers of the disappeared. I don't belong to any particular party. I am not a communist, although members of my family wanted to accuse me and turn me in to the junta. And that's very painful. And they were all Jews. So I documented the work and I have been working in the ways in which 
textiles and gender and uh, the underprivileged and ordinary women make changes uh, in the political life of their countries. You can find all my, my work in Amazon and the book is called Threads of Hope, the story of the Chilean Altillera. And right now my, my um, contribution to human rights is as a poet, as a writer, and I have uh, discovered that it's very important for me to write for children mm -hmm. because I want to educate them. And I think that children demand absolute honesty for a writer. And I've written two young adult books. Um, I lived in Butterfly Hill and uh, Maps of Memory that deal with Chile, just political justice, and how do you uh, educate young people to be um, uh, citizens engaged in civil society? Mm -hmm. Yes, there, that's very, very important. Um, Someone in the Q&A has said, I'm a Chilean American as well, currently in the conversion process. I find it difficult to find community of other Chilean or Latin A Jews. How do you navigate finding a community of other Spanish speaking or Latin A Jews? Or how do you find that, um, or how do you kind of reconcile those two identities? Okay, uh, the first question is how this Chilean American wants to find community in, in America. Who's the first one? Correct. That's a very, very tough question because when we, and I'm just giving you my personal example, when we arrived to Georgia uh, in the 70s, uh, they've never seen a, a Chilean Jew. They even asked us if we live in, uh, uh, in tents or, uh, or if we own a refrigerator. Uh, they could not imagine that we were highly educated people and it was very hard for us to belong to the temple because no one talked to us. The Southern Jews are different than the Jews from the East. They have their own belief system, maybe prejudices. So we quit, we renounced our membership to the temple. And my, my mother, and not so much my father, because he was very, he liked to be alone, but my mother found community among the Catholics of Athens, Georgia. And she went to the Newman Center. She was happy. Why? Because they share the same culture, the Latin Catholics. Uh, I, I wish you could write me later. I could talk to you about this, but the huge problem of America, among so many others, is how you create communities. How do you share? How, how do you embrace? Uh, everything is by appointment. You, if, you know, a cocktail party could happen seven months from now. I think some people are happy in the pandemic because they don't have to see anyone. I think it's very hard to create community here and people are very much alone. Um, so I have created my own community um, through my books. I have created some anthologies. I have like gathered friends that live in India, Pakistan, um, uh, Europe. And I have created communities through literature and through the imagination. But real concrete communities, no. I don't think I have friends, but I don't think I have like a Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And that's very sad and very puzzling to myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. There's another question here about um, uh, the Jewish community in Chile today, specifically about um, intermarriage in the Jewish community. And then um, as the second part to that, um, looking to get some information about food and specifically um, if, um, their cuisine has become a part of um, Chile's cuisine. Yeah. Um, the, I can only speak about the communities that I belong to, which I, it's, it's my home, it's the community of Viña del Mar. And I would like to say 50% of the members of this community are mixed marriages, intermarriage. But um, I think it's a, it's a beautiful community because 
people accept each other's faith, religion. Um, and I'm sure also in the communities of Santiago, but also I'd like to say that all over the world, uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of people, a lot of young people that choose uh, to become Orthodox Jews. And in Chile, it's the same phenomenon. So a lot of uh, young people are choosing the path of Orthodoxy. They have Habad, they have Orthodox communities, or they move to yeshivas in, in Israel. Uh, the Santiago community, of course, it has more, also has mixed marriages. Um, and there's a very, very liberal and beautiful community called Ruach Ami uh, that integrates more of mixed marriages, but I'm sure other communities are stricter in the sense of you can only marry a Jew, but I'm not that familiar with those communities. Thank you. I just like to add that someone um, made a comment um, in regards to the previous question about the organization Jutina and Co. They say that they're a Latin uh, Latino community of Latin Jews and that they have a Instagram and website and um, we're actually going to be working with them on an upcoming program and so I would definitely recommend um, checking them out. They have a lot of resources on their website, a lot of um, stories and testimonies and um, recipes too. And they, um, they're a great resource for finding events and communities related to um, Jewish Latin American life. So thank you uh, to the person that submitted that. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I know you mentioned that you and your family um, when you left Chile, do you have any family remaining in um, Chile today? I have a huge family and uh, I'm in touch with all of them. Today I called a lot of them, maybe they're watching and I asked them for concrete details about uh, the Jewish community, especially of Inya. And uh, I, um, I think that the beauty of my family that they don't make distinction between first class and second class. We are like a clan. We are about 150 of us. and. Um, uh, living here has made me miss birthdays, weddings, funerals, um, because my family here is very, very small. But I find that they are, uh, I am the happiest because I really talk about our family and the stories. And even though the older generation um, has died, that my generation remembers them. And I hope that our children will also remember us. Uh, but I do have a, a very large extended family that never left Chile. Thank you. And I think we'll do one more. I think this will be a quick one. Um, how many Jews came to Chile in, in 1492 from, uh, from Spain, which you referenced at the beginning? The statistics are, are abysmally, uh, incomplete. I, when I did uh, historical research, read they say the, a few, five, <laughs> six. I don't know how many, but it was a time where um, things were not really uh, recorded. But they did arrive, escaping the the Inquisition. Thank you. So I think with that, I will wrap us up, and I just want to say thank you so much, Marjorie, for sharing your story and for sharing all that you know about um, this, uh, the Jewish community in Chile. I know I certainly learned um, so much from your presentation, so thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank Robert who introduced tonight's program and Trillian for providing tech support. And thank you all for in the audience for joining us. We're gonna be dropping a couple links into the chat um, so first we'll have a link to the upcoming program that was referenced in the intro. So join us next Thursday. We'll be back at um, 1 p.m. this time for a presentation about um, Jewish life in Egypt. So that link should be in the chat. You can also check out all of our past programs in this series that we've done about exploring global Jewish life via the next link in chat. 
Next up, there'll be two links where you can explore Mar more of Marjorie's work. There's a link to an article that she wrote about growing up in Jewish Chile, as well as um, the book that we linked to earlier, um, Braided Memories, which uh, featured photographs um, from Samuel Schatz, whose work you saw earlier. And as a reminder, the other links to the books that were referenced um, are in the chat if you just scroll up. Um, and finally, as a reminder, as you leave the program today, you'll be redirected to a survey about your experience. If you could please just take a couple moments to fill that out. It really does help us as we plan for our future programming. So once again, thank you, Marjorie, and thank you everyone for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon. Have a great thank evening. You. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.